Welcome to the third masterclass in our boardroom programme. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Radden, partner at KPMG London. Mark graduated with LLB Law in 1999 and he's here to talk to us this evening all about how to land a job in one of the big four. Uh, pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Shame it's uh, via Google Hangout, but it's a sign of the times. Um, so, so look, my brief uh, background uh, uh, is, as you said, that I joined, went to Sheffield in 1996. Seems uh, rather a long time ago now. And graduated in 99. Uh, I live, you know, a brief uh, summary of my experience uh, at Sheffield. I I studied law, so I was up in at that stage. The law faculty was um, up in Crooksmoor. I think I don't I believe is no longer the law uh, faculty, um, and I lived in Broad Lane Court, which, if uh, as my the, the student flats in the first year, so opposite the um, uh, the church, uh, which used to be part of the management. We used to have lectures in the church. I'm not sure if that still happens down by the engineering faculty and and management school. So, and one of my other, I suppose, uh, claims of fame in my time at Sheffield was I captained the uh, the tennis team uh as well which was which was great fun um so i suppose in terms of where that led me i decided that um perhaps becoming a uh, a lawyer wasn't wasn't for me uh even though i thoroughly enjoyed the the experience of the degree and it it, it gave me uh, exposure to some very talented and career-minded uh, uh people who became you know great great lawyers uh, in many cases along the way but i was one of the few that decided to use the law degree to go off in a different direction. So it was around the end of 1998 and my housemate um, at the time had, had gone to the, been more proactive than me and gone to the careers uh, service and got the application forms for PwC, uh, Deloitte and uh, KPMG. I'm not sure where EY uh, was at the time. Uh, but anyway, the three application forms. And so uh, back in those days, which sounds, sounds very antiquated, they were paper forms. So you had a second form in case you went wrong. So we each filled in one form uh, each, saving, saving some trees along the way, and sent them off to these three firms. I was uh, rejected outright by Deloitte. I don't think I was, uh, I was clearly not intelligent enough for Deloitte. They had uh, some kind of higher bar of, uh, uh, of academics. Um, and I got, off, I got uh, uh, invitations to interview with PwC and KPMG. And the P, because I was doing... Part of my degree I was doing, uh, one of the modules I enjoyed was uh, corporate restructuring or corporate insolvency uh, uh, law. So I decided to tick the box for restructuring in both firms uh, rather than straight audit. And uh, unfortunately, PwC were full in restructuring. Uh, but So I had a, an invitation to an interview out for audits, whereas KPMG was a restructuring uh, trainee uh, program. So I interviewed with both. Uh, and fortunately got a, a job offer from both and was going to go to PwC and, and do audit, if I'm honest, but um, because, uh, you know, they seem to be a much smarter outfit, had much uh, better, uh, better offices and uh, uh, better quality of lunch, maybe, and things as well. And uh, there was slightly more, slightly more money, uh, uh, which was pretty important as after three years of university. Um, but one of the things they did back then was you went for an open day once you had an offer, and met some of the people that you were going to join with and some of the people that you'd work with. And it was only um, on the KPMG Open Day when I was fairly dead set on going to PwC that I was sat there with um, some, uh, some soon-to-be colleagues and some, 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 other, some people that had become lifelong friends and realised that actually probably the fit for me in the KPMG culture or the people I met was stronger and actually restructuring sounded more interesting than... Uh, than straight to audit uh, and therefore I chose to go to KPMG in the end to join uh, join restructuring uh, albeit that still meant doing a, um, a chartered accountancy qualification so the ACA which meant a lot of exams so if my if my logic had been to avoid going to do a, a full year of um, LPC to become a lawyer uh, I, I managed to go and start work but actually got three years of exams rather than one year so the logic there uh, falls down slightly perhaps um, but I think, you know, a key thing for me was, was that I was going to be joining KPMG with 120 other graduates, you know, in the same position, going into London for the, for the first time. Uh, and that sounded like a, a lot of fun, you know, even though we were going to have to work 
uh, hard. It was going to be a bit different to the uh, three years at university. So I, I went down to London in um, September of, of 99 and started at KPMG. Um, I guess at the time, I probably saw it as a three-year three year role, get my ACA and then think about which area of business I might want to go into with you know, a decent financial grounding and a, and a chartered accountancy qualification. Uh, the fact that I'm there, still there 21 years later, I guess, which is now uh, just about to become exactly half of my, my life, um, I guess suggests that I've found something of interest in those 21 years and hopefully learned one or two things along the way uh, as well. So I wanted to share some of that experience, both um, you know, the stories of things I've done, but also the things I might have learned that might have transferability to, to you all in your, your careers, whether they're in big four or in completely other different, um, different walks of life. Um, and then come on to talk a little bit about uh, how, where I see this going, where I see the sector going you know, in big four and, and some of the current uh, challenges and opportunities, and, and particularly with a COVID uh, lens on that. So I'll go back to, um, to 1999, or actually fast forward to 2000. My first, some of my first restructuring projects were, um, uh, were one of the first was going out to Saudi Arabia uh, to help a family group of companies drive profit and cash improvements through the portfolio. So I spent a couple of months, uh, I think I came back once, a couple of months in, in Jeddah with a team of people, but, but living in, uh, in Saudi, which was uh, you know, a pretty uh, uh, interesting experience, uh, certainly unlike anything I'd, I'd done before. I'd mainly traveled around Europe to that point, and therefore going into, uh, into Saudi was, um, yeah, which to be honest is something that at that point not a lot of, uh, there weren't many routes into Saudi other than through work. Uh, um, was a really interesting experience. Not always easy, but certainly uh, interesting. And actually, over the course of the 21 years, I've been fortunate enough to to work or travel with work to uh, uh, 36 different countries and and counting. So I've had a pretty global um, global experience. Um, in terms of the roles, I'll talk about the roles that I've that I've. Uh, had and that, how that progressed and I'll come back to some of the clients that I've worked with. So um, I progressed through reasonably uh, uh, quickly um, and I made, became a partner in 2010. So I've now spent the last 10 years as a, as a partner. Before becoming a partner, I got my uh, ACA and then KPMG sponsored me through an MBA, which I did in a combination of Edinburgh Management School and then uh, one of the Grand Ecole in, uh, in Paris. So I was fortunate enough to get three three block releases of, uh, uh, from work to go, and, uh, uh, to go and do an MBA, which I found hugely beneficial. And then since then, I've also had the chance to do a sort of one year part-time course at London Business School as well. So I think um, even with a degree and even if you do a professional qualification, one thing I would say is, you know, you never stop learning. And as soon as you do stop sort of going for the next uh, learning experience, I think you're, you know, you're starting to plateau in terms of your experience. So um, so that was a really big part of those first 10 years was, was getting successive qualifications and gaining more, more knowledge that would give me some of the raw material to, to, to be, uh, be successful in the, in the client work. Uh, in terms of roles, beyond becoming a partner, um, I took on the role of global head of turnaround in 2016, which is something I still, still do. So managing that across, uh, across the network. Um, and then, uh, I've, I sat, I, until recently, I sat on the board of KPMG in the UK uh, as an elected board member. Uh, so and this is on the board, so effectively as a non-exec uh, with oversight over the exec team, which has been an interesting period of time to be on the board of a big four firm, given the level of regulatory uh, change from the FRC and the, the various government-driven um, reviews into the sector, which we might touch on later on. And then my current role alongside the global uh, turnaround role is running a team that we call Special Situations Group, which basically helps organisations um, to uh, generate and uh, preserve value in difficult situations, whether that be a restructuring uh, situation, so distress, or whether that be just a part of the business hitting challenges. So you can imagine in uh, whenever the world um, hits challenges like COVID or global financial crisis before or 9-11 further back, I'm old enough to have been working when 9-11 
uh, happened, or even the dot com. Some of my first clients were the uh, uh, businesses failing after the dot com bubble burst in what was that, 2001 or so. So um, uh, this group looks after uh, clients in special situations, which has been extremely busy in the current COVID environment and a, and a role that I find uh, extremely varied, given that we get to work around the world, but also with businesses of lots of different sizes across different sectors, some privately owned, some private equity backed, some uh, big listed PLC. So it's uh, nothing if not uh, varied. And I think that would be one thing that I would draw out of my 21 years is the reason I've stayed so long is that it's, you know, no, no two working weeks have ever been the same. Uh, I've always got, uh, if I'm probably involved in 10 different projects at any one time, you know, it's rare that two of them even look vaguely the same. So it's a, it's a very varied uh, role. And I think if I was to try and get that experience in a, um, in a, a line role in a, in a company, it would be very difficult still to, to get that level of variety of experience over such a concentrated period of time without uh, putting my CV uh, into recruitment consultants in some very regular intervals to, to change roles uh, so much. So that's a bit about some of the roles I've had. If I think about some of the clients I've worked with and the things I've seen along the, along the way, as I said, um, yeah, I mentioned the Saudi project, but if you go to 2001, I was working with a, a, doc, a group of dot-com businesses that were running out of cash. So they bought a, um, a couple of entrepreneurs had bought a whole range of different companies in the sort of broadly in the telco and early kind of internet uh, space. And uh, they were running out of cash at an alarming rate, basically because they hadn't really um, put together what the, the, uh, the working capital requirements, the liquidity requirements would be of these combined businesses. And so they were they were burning through the capital they'd raised very, very quickly. So our, our job was to try and understand where the, uh, where the cash uh, burn was coming from, um, putting in place forecasting and mitigation measures to try and uh, help the business survive. Uh, and it actually did survive for a time, or certainly through our work, uh, with a windfall from selling a, um, selling a stake in, uh, uh, in a piece of technology they'd driven, which is around a, a billing platform. So they managed to monetize that. Uh, quickly and they later did a, a rights issue so it was one of my first sort of t tastes of of uh, a cash crisis and, uh, and it happens to be in a dot-com business if i fast forward to um the early early days of the global financial Well, Mark, you're you're cutting out there for us a little bit. We should maybe turn our cameras off so that Mark's can so we can hear what Mark's saying. Uh, can you hear me or not? Yeah, Mark. We just we've just asked people to turn their cameras off because you cut it up then, but we can hear you again now. So we'll just keep our cameras off and and just check that we can we, we can hear you now going forwards. We might have missed the last little bit you just said. <laughs> yeah, just the last thirty seconds. Okay, that's no problem. I think you, I think I had an incoming phone call, which might have been what threw it off, but um. Right. Apologies. So I was just saying in 2007, um, just as subprime was hitting as the sort of forerunner of the global financial crisis, I was on Common at 3i, the, um, the global private equity uh, house working in their, their buyouts team. So I was fortunate enough through KPMG to, um, uh, to get to go on Common into private equity and see the kind of investment side of life. Still looking at some of the same things, so looking at buying businesses to turn them around. Uh, that gave me some very different experiences and perspectives and also an interesting position to watch the uh, global financial crisis uh, unfold. Um, once, I'd, once the global, once uh, Lehman's had, had fallen, I spent a large part of the global financial crisis working in, uh, uh, in Jaguar Land Rover. So Jaguar Land Rover had just been bought by, uh, by uh, Tata uh, from Ford. 
and uh, that was in 2008, just as the just as the global financial crisis uh, unfolded. Clearly, selling sports cars and SUVs uh, in the middle of a global financial crisis was was not a great position to be in a business that had extraordinarily high, like any uh, automotive OEM, uh, high fixed costs and a very fragile um, uh, demand line that that switched off very quickly and was also very dependent on both consumer credit and financing to uh, uh, to keep the business going as a global business serving over 160 markets. So I spent a, a very enjoyable, or if challenging, 18 months working with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, advising the board and, and uh, helping them uh, survive effectively and then start to drive uh, the turnaround, which for a time was pretty spectacular for the following sort of 10 years, eight or nine years, uh, driven off new product innovation and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, penetration of the Chinese market in, in particular, uh, which was spectacular for, for a time. Obviously, they, they're they going back through some challenges uh, this time around as well, but I'm sure they'll find their, their way through. Um, from Jaguar Land Rover, I was fortunate enough to carry on working in the Tata Group, which is a, a, a fascinating um, a family trust uh, own um, structure of uh, of a lot of different, a conglomerate in old, in old speak. And so I moved on to do some work in Mumbai with Tata Motors, which was uh, was great experience. And then spent four years working with Tata Steel through various uh, trials and tribulations, including uh, um, it nearly uh, failing in um, 2016, uh, just before the um, just before the referendum, uh, the, the EU referendum, actually, which in a strange way helped them uh, recover and rebound for a time because of the way they were hedged on raw material, on currency and raw materials. Um, but also uh, uh, we, we, we ran a process to, to help them survive and get a new uh, lease of life. Again, a business that is quite cyclical and has further challenges. But I spent four uh, enjoyable years working with them as a client as well as, as a number of others. Um, yeah, we could go on. I mentioned private equity. I'm fortunate enough to now work uh, with some of the leading uh, private equity houses as, as clients. So KKR, Bain Capital, Simven, um, uh, all houses that we work with driving value creation projects in their, in their portfolio, which is a, uh, you know, which are interesting projects, give very varied exposure to geographies and different industry sectors and, and situations uh, and so forth. Um, but I wouldn't want you to think that it was all about private equity and industrial businesses. I think retail has also been um, uh, a massive part of my sort of 21 year career within KPMG from one of the first audit clients I ever worked on through to you know, many turnarounds and, uh, and restructurings that I've been involved in. So I've been fortunate enough to have access to the to board members, um, at some of the you know, leading uh, retailers, particularly in the grocery sector. Uh, in the UK. So I've worked with Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Co-op and Asda and Marks and Spencer's and Debenham's and, and many more across the, uh, across the years, you know, John Lewis as well. And so uh, it's really interesting as an advisor to get sort of deep into a sector and follow it over a period of what, nearly you know, 20 years and see how things unfold. You know, online retail was, uh, when I first started working with retailers, was, was probably, you know, very much in its uh, infancy and not, not a big thing. So seeing the, how the project predictions around that, um, you know, oscillate between, uh, uh, between how, how quickly or slowly that will actually replace high street retail. And then seeing, uh, working with a number of names to, to sort of work through the, the, the challenges uh, that face that sector. And I think I'd give you, um, you know, three dimensions to think about any sector as we go through turbulent times. I would look at the, um, the exposure of a sector to uh, macroeconomic factors, so retail obviously being directly exposed and very quickly exposed to consumer demand. Secondly, uh, think about the existential uh, or structural challenges um, facing a sector. So for retail, that would be you know, shift to online, change in consumer uh, preferences, um, and convenience and experiential uh, shopping and so forth. Um, and then, uh, but for automotive, it would be, you know, shift, shift, uh, shift towards electric cars, moving away from buying from a car dealer to buying, buying online, et cetera, et cetera. So you can pick these uh, sort of structural changes that, that industry sectors um, face uh, and, and understand how impact that's going to have combined with the macro um, economic impact 
and then thirdly think about you know management's role in that so think about management's uh, how proactive they are to, to pivot a business away from a sector in decline into new areas how quickly they respond to changes in customer uh, behavior or customer demand or cu customer um, uh, preferences um, and those three factors are a pretty good way of analyzing what's going to happen to both sectors and particular uh, winners and losers in a in a sector and i've been fortunate enough to get you know to work across a wide range of sectors and different geographies in the different stages through several economic cycles now um, with kpmg so i guess you might say that's enough about what have i um what have i done um and hopefully some of those experiences are interesting and by all means ask questions as we get through let's try and distill that into um some some pearls of wisdom some areas that you might be able to take take forward with so i narrowed it down to five um but we can pick up more in uh, in the questions and so i think the first thing if i look at my career in, in a big four you know it's an opportunity rich environment and therefore um people that put their hand up uh for things with with enthusiasm tend to get on pretty well and that sounds incredibly basic um and something that probably everyone can do but enthusiasm and uh um and a sort of can-do attitude go an awful long way and that's both putting your hand up for work but also throwing yourselves into the kind of uh social um or you know, sporting elements that some you know, firms like big four have so i got very involved in the kpmg tennis team from when i first joined and played within that for 10 years had some great experiences traveling and uh playing uh in other countries and and meeting a lot of colleagues who are outside of my area of work but gave me a network through the through the firm so they are firms that re reward networking and i know that's maybe sounds old school but they are firms that still reward those that actually network widely across um across the organization not just uh in their own team and and people who take the opportunities that are there so i mentioned um putting my hand up to go to to saudi that was uh, a difficult thing to do at the time in some ways uh, on a personal level but it was a yeah really formative um uh, experience and i've always tended to go and you know, put my hand up for the for the overseas assignments or the difficult assignments and uh, throw yourself uh, into it which i think links to the second the second one which is about sort of bringing your whole self to work to coin a phrase and that's both um you know, bringing your personality uh, to work not in an inappropriate way obviously you have to judge this the situation but i think um uh, you know, we all spend a lot of time at, at work. Uh, it's a big part of our, our, our lives. And therefore, you know, people will remember you more. You'll, be, you'll stand out if you allow something of your personality and your, your, um, uh, your character to, 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 to spill into to meetings and uh, interactions with clients or colleagues. You know, that, that is important. And I think, I'm not saying, you know, you probably grow into that over time. It's certainly a reflection of mine that it, it uh, probably become became more uh, confident about uh yeah being myself and and uh um uh you know with clients with me meetings and so forth and not being too kind of too inappropriately formal or or um you know, stiff in terms of communications people will people do want to enjoy working they'll if you pick the the environment and, and how people are then you know it's possible to have um to, to, to laugh and smile in the, in the name of doing work. It doesn't have to be deadly serious all of the time. And actually uh, some levity can quite often unlock relationships and, uh, uh, and, uh, and be, be an important part of being successful. Yeah, we, we did a whole training course at one point, you know, imaginatively called, uh, you know, people buy from people they like. And in a world of, um, you know, maybe more sophisticated world where people can research you on LinkedIn and, uh, and various in consulting on the various sort of indices, you know, there is still a, a strong place for building relationships and that's done much more uh, quickly if you, uh, if you allow your personality to, to, uh, to come out in, uh, in conversations and interactions. So I would encourage you to, to think about that and you know, over time to get more comfortable in, uh, uh, in, in being yourself. And then I think thirdly, um, I talk to my team a lot about, uh, when they ask me about different experiences and breadth of experience versus depth of experience, you know, about keeping the learning curve steep. So never making it too comfortable. Um, you never stop learning. You know, um, 
I think when I, when I became a partner, my, my boss at the time uh, gave me maybe a, a few days to, 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 to enjoy the achievement and then sat me down and said, well, you're only just really starting to, to learn now. So you're, uh, you've got a long way to go. So make sure you stay humble and, uh, and stay open to, to learning. And, and that, was, that was good advice. Um, uh, you know, I think in a, in a rapidly changing world, whether it be technology, technology or um, technological disruption or whether that's changing, changing uh, working practices, which is topical at the moment, you know, at the moment you uh, aren't flexible and agile is the moment your sort of value to organizations goes down and you're on the, uh, probably on the decline uh, in, in your career because I firmly believe that um, you've got to be able to adapt to a changing environment, even if you stay in the same company or in the same same walk of life. So, you know, in my own in my own role, I now you know most of our work is done at some level uh, within um, uh, at some level uh, using technology, using uh, big data analytics, whether it be Alteryx, Power BI, ClickSense, or whatever it might be. And so, whilst I kind of missed the boat in developing those as as skills myself, then I have to sell services that are based on those. I have to present to clients using those technologies and explain and identify what it might be able to do to them. So the sort of, uh, you know, the, the use cases for them. Um, so if, if you're not agile, if I'd have stayed where I was when we started, which was, you know, I sent my first email on my first day of work. Um, we didn't really use computers for, for, for as much. There was still a lot of handwritten uh, file notes and things, uh, you know, at, at that time. So if you don't manage to keep adapting to the environment around you, then you, then you will have a, a challenge to, to be as successful as your skills, um, you know, the way skills could take you. And then I think, you know, a reflection I've had later in, in my career is, you know, and you, you can't be blanket about this, but I, I, do, I do try and work with people I like and, and, uh, and do things that I enjoy. And clearly you have to be, you have to do whatever the role entails. But I think if you, if you find roles that, uh, and people to work with and, and in that, that you enjoy, then your enthusiasm, your, the fact that you're enjoying it will be um, clear to those around you and you'll probably be more successful, not to mention if you're going to work for 30 or 40 or, you know, who knows, maybe more years in, um, in, the, in the current generations, then, then doing something you enjoy um, and you feel uh, confident, comfortable with the contribution it makes is, is pretty important, I would say. And that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't all have to be a capitalist um, you know, a, a capitalist measure of what's, uh, what, what success looks like or, or, or what, what um, contribution you're making. So my fifth point would be that I would, I would have a, you know, five or six dimensions of life uh, that you keep, you keep sort of written down somewhere and you, you revisit over time and you look at their relative importance to one another, both now and in the future. And you, you match that to your... Um, you match that to your personal situation. So I think I probably um, learned the hard way in some ways that you can't, you can't manage your personal life and your work life in parallel. It doesn't work. You know, one will have a bearing on the other, you know, and vice, vice, versa, vice versa. So you have to look at it in the round and you have to understand at certain points in time uh, and, and agree with the people around you, you know, where your priorities are going to be. You know, and give you some ideas of dimension, dimensions, you know, clearly one would be, work-life balance and you know, how much time you've got things to do outside of time you've got things to do things outside of work uh, another would be uh, wealth but I would uh, yeah wealth accretion but I would break that down by kind of in-year earnings or P&L if you like and um, balance sheets so you know uh, where are you going to have one-off capital events you're going to set your own business up and have the chance that it might just fly and you might exit to uh, you know Google or, or, uh, or Twitter or Facebook and uh, and have some different options in life uh, beyond that at a very early stage. That's not going to happen in a, you know, in a, in a big four or as a doctor or, or something. You know, it's going to be uh, in a lot more entrepreneurial environment. So you need to think about what your plan is and how that would work. I think you also need to look at, you know, do you want to be um, have a legacy? Do you want to build a reputation for being kind of uh, a leading leading in a in a in a space, or are you happy? achieving either um you know achieving more anonymously in a in a corporate or in a in a consulting or something where you won't be uh well known or or uh necessarily but 
but you can achieve a lot and you may achieve some of those other goals as well. So I think that's important. And in these, I would add into that at the moment as, as well, ever more so in the, in the um, you know, world where CSR is a, is a, is a top boardroom uh, subject. But you know, thinking about your societal impact of what you do. So for some people, that will be far more important than, uh, uh, than how much money you make or, um, yeah, and, and, and so forth. So have your dimensions. There's no right, right or wrong, but have your, have your six or seven dimensions and think about them for the, for the next year or a couple of years and then, then more medium term. And the, and the key is to revisit them, not just on your own, but with people around you and, uh, and think about the decisions you, you make about your career in the context of those things that are important to you and the relativity between them. And if you do that, I think you can have um, a degree of peace with whichever way that goes, because you make informed decisions about what you want to do. You don't fall into the trap of thinking you can have, you know, uh, all things at the same time uh, without some trade-offs between. Them. But the trade-offs don't have to be permanent. You know, they can they can ebb and flow depending on what's going on in your life and the stage you're at and and what's important to you. And that's the trick of managing a successful career um, in the long term rather than sort of, uh, you know, a... Uh, a very short term sort of sprint to get as far as you can and then finding actually when you get there you might have missed out on a few things uh, along the way and, and see life a little bit differently once you're once you're there so uh the risk of getting too too abstract uh but bring it back to what i think we're seeing now and then open to questions um yeah i guess over the last few years in professional services then there's been a lot of debate around uh what will the impact be of of AI, of big data analytics on, on a lot of the kind of smart, smart person consulting that, uh, that underpins professional services and big four alike. I think that, that will continue, but I think what we're finding just as previous um, shifts in, the, in what we do have shown is that, um, is that you, you, could, if you're, you can adapt with it. So as the point I made earlier about remaining agile, remaining sponge-like in your ability to to, to shift with with changes and and, and adapt to uh, to where the demand is, you know I think professional services will do that, um, but there will be elements of it which uh, disappear undoubtedly. And the question is, how can you can you innovate and introduce new areas of helping clients as uh, just as quickly as you um, as you sunset other areas? You know, in the COVID environment, then I do think. Um, this virtual working, you know, I've delivered since the start of lockdown, I've delivered projects start to finish all around the world through Teams and Zoom and uh, Google Hangout. Um, and so I don't think we can ever say again that that isn't possible because the outcomes have been probably as successful as had we had we've done them uh, you know, face to face. So I think that is the cat is out of the bag on that. You know, I remember 10 years ago, people predicting the rapid decline of business travel, even 20 years ago after kind of 9-11, you know, 19 years ago, people predicting uh, how rapidly people would slow down their traveling, and it didn't happen, partly because people wanted to travel, partly because there was always a, a view that was pervasive that, um, that you got better quality outcomes by meeting face-to-face. -face. I think some of that will survive, but it will be, it'll be more selective, and I think a lot, lot more of this will, a lot more work will happen uh, you know, through the technology, and there'll be a lot less travel, albeit some of it will recover over time. Um, but I think the core skills for success do, you know, do remain uh, relatively stable. Uh, certainly in my 21 years, you know, which has seen a lot of change when you think about it, I still think you know, the ability to build relationships um, is important uh, and will take you a long way. You know, the ability to adapt and to learn new skills and be receptive and have the attitude to, to adapt into different skills and remain broad and, and um, uh, yeah, but remain broad skilled is, is important the people that manage to do that will be well placed to deal with whatever um, shifts in, in demand for, for people based um, services uh, that there are um, and so I'd, you know, I'd always challenge yourself to, to, um, to st stay agile in your ability to shift to, to, to different things to, to look at different areas and be um, uh, yeah, and be able to succeed in them. I often wonder, you know, given there was a fair amount of fate, uh, you know, to go back to the start of my presentation before you had questions, there was a fair amount of fate in me choosing to apply to, you know, to the big four. I wasn't, I didn't have a set plan 
that I was going to go and join a counselling firm, let alone stay there for 21 years. And so I do believe that if you've got some of the core skills around, uh, you know, people and leadership and, uh, um, and some, some core skills around, you know, managing change or uh, you're financially literate, you're pretty set up to be successful in a number of, walk of life, walks of life. Clearly, there's an element of finding the right one for you. Having not changed from KPMG, but having worked in a lot of other organizations, I don't know for sure that, you know, that, um, that I picked the right, the right place, but I know it's, you know, it's suited me well. Would I have been as successful, more successful, less successful in other organizations? You know, there'd be a range of that. It's unlikely that I picked the best uh, place I could possibly go, given that I you know, only applied to four or five firms. But you know, I think if you've got the core skills, then uh, you, know, you can be successful in different environments. Um, and you sort of that's you know you may change careers in these increasingly changed times. You may change careers a couple of times in your in the course of your career, but you'll you'll find that skills are much more transferable than you than you imagine uh, in your first kind of uh, first role. I've certainly learned that that you can you can challenge yourself successfully to um, to use the skills you've got and the experiences you've got in different spheres and still be successful. I think that would be an important skill for. Uh, for for um, for all of us in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. So I've probably spoken for at least long enough, um, and I'd really appreciate your questions uh, on any of that. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, that's a really fantastic insight into your your career journey and your career at KPMG. Um, I'm sure that your your expertise of of managing. Uh, you know, managing challenging situations and working in challenging situations must be absolutely invaluable to the company at the moment. Um, and, you know, some really great uh, sharing of your personal experience and your tips for success there um, from relationship building, keeping learning, being agile, doing work that you enjoy, all real pearls of wisdom. And I love your dimensions of, of dimensions of life model as well. That's fantastic. Um, so we'd just like to start the Q&A by uh, inviting some of our graduates who uh, pre-submitted some questions to ask theirs. So I think given we've had a few signal problems, we'll keep cameras off. But as, if I ask you to ask your question, if you could switch on your camera um, and your mic uh, to reveal yourself to ask your question, that would be great. So we have a question here um, from Fiona Lambert. You asked a question about uh, Mark's leadership style. Are you there, Fiona? Hello, yes, I'm here. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for your time this evening. It's been really interesting. Um, and my question is about leadership. So describe your leadership style and how have you had to adapt your leadership um, style throughout your career? Yeah, it's a great, great, great question. Um, I think leadership, you know, I think people can look at leadership as, um, uh, as being, you know, when you're running a team or a big organisation, actually your leadership uh, experiences start, you know, right back when you're in uh, university. So uh, I mentioned sort of counselling in the tennis team. Uh, I think when we turned up at KPMG, uh, we, we compared notes. It was amazing how many uh, captains of various sports teams or societies there were in the intake. And I think that's partly because they realised that there are some experiences you gain and things like that of, of leadership. But for me, personally, I think... Um, I try and be uh, not be hierarchical. So I try and look at it that if I think about a you know, big four in particular, when everyone's you know, potentially on the same trajectory, I try and remember that um, actually someone joining in their first year, you know, is just a, a different. It's just going through the same, the same uh, you know uh, experience, of making their way in this in the same way, and uh, and therefore there's no. You know, it doesn't need to be hierarchical. You, you have peerless conversations. I think one of the, if you can put people at ease and be approachable, then you, um, you go a long way. So one of my core values has always been, which has been tested as the teams I leave got bigger and bigger, but has always been to, to make time for people. If, so, if anyone in the team, you know, however um, junior or senior, um, wants to grab time for a coffee to talk about their career or their experience, then I'll make time in my diary. It might not be, that day, or the, 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 you know, um, in the same but as quickly as can to make to make time. And I think being approachable is um, uh, is really important. Um, I've also had to learn that being resilient is really important. And you know, when you're leading a team, yeah. you can't wait. You want to be approachable and, and authentic um, 
so not just the kind of uh, robot. So you have to share a little bit of yourself, but equally you have to deal with some challenges sort of in private. So in, in, in my world at the moment, you know, we have an interesting thing where, you know, the big four is being disrupted by, by sort of American boutiques in the restructuring space. And therefore we lose quite a lot of people. There's a lot more turnover of staff than there used to be. And so, you know, my resilience has to be to, you know, when people are worrying in the team, we've lost people to, to, to lead from the front in terms of saying, yeah, well, we, we will, we will overcome this and, uh, you know, the team will still succeed and so forth. So some of that, some of that frustration, how you have to sort of, um, uh, uh, air or, or, um, work through outside of the, the glare of your, your, your team. Equally, there's something authentic about, sharing how you feel with the team as well. So it's a, it's a balance. Uh, you don't want to be um, completely detached from them. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, Drama Wen Mao, um, you had a question about challenges. Are you here? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mark, for sharing your precious experience. Uh, and my question is, what is the biggest challenge you have encountered in your career and how did you deal with this challenge? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, probably, lots, probably lots of challenges, but um, as I said, if, um, if, you're not finding new, if you're not finding things challenging, you're probably, you're probably starting to plateau. Not mm -hmm. taking on sort of putting yourself outside your comfort zone because you'll always learn more when you're outside your comfort zone. So if I think of some of the times in my career where I felt most outside of my uh, comfort zone and so been most challenging, I guess, um, there was a time, probably one of the first times I had to lead a team was actually on the turnaround of a hospital. And so I remember we'd won this project and uh, we're starting it and we went into the into the into one of the first kickoff meetings with the actually the exec team of the hospital and then my team as well. And um, as well as those times, I realised that we got into the room to look at it and everyone just looked at me and said, well, what do we do now? <laughs> and that was quite a, um, quite a sort of fun moment. But obviously, to that point in your career, you've probably you know, often been working on a sort of task focus where people have asked you to, to go and do things. And then at, around that time, as I was sort of a senior manager, in the middle there, it starts to shift and suddenly people look to you as to set the direction of, of where you're where you're heading and um, you know that that's always um, yeah more challenging than than following to a series of, of tasks so uh, and it's a challenging situation with you know with lots of different stakeholders and so forth so that, that would be one and possibly not the most but I think you just pick out particular points where you where you face into um, different challenges of, of, of leadership and that's one that uh, still sits in my mind even though it's probably 14 or so years ago, I guess it was. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, Ewan Berry, uh, Ewan, you had a question about um, about competition really within the, the big four and uh, in, in the industry. Are you there, Ewan? Yeah, I'm here if it works. <laughs> Mark, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so my question was, do you think that we are better off with the big four dominating the financial services industry, or do you think more competition would be healthy? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I think you often that question gets uh, posed in the audit context, um, and because I think in in if you go outside, so first of all, if I answer the non-audit piece, which is where I sit, and then I'll answer the audit piece. Outside of audit, I think there is healthy competition. So if you look at, there are very few parts of what the big four do in advisory where you haven't got strong competition outside of, um, outside of the big four. So if I look in my own space into sort of restructuring and turnaround, you know, particularly now, as I mentioned, you know, that, that now is, um, uh, is really strong competition from the strat houses, you know, the, the, the strategy houses, so the Bain and the McKinsey's and the BCG's and ATK and so forth, uh, but also from American boutiques who've entered the European market, who are specialists in that space, so people like, Alvarez and Marcel and FTI and Alex Partners and so forth, uh, and then a number of number of other smaller firms. So and that and if you look in consulting, then the big four don't really dominate any areas of consulting. Maybe finance transformation or with the reasonably high up, but anything around technology, then you obviously enter into competition with Accenture or the big 
um, technology of this Oracle or you know, SAP, et cetera. So, so it's really, that question does probably boil down to, to audit. Um, and as part of my board role within KPMG, I did go back to audit in a way because I sat on some of the uh, forums that looked to what was happening to the, uh, the future of the profession. And um, I, think, I think more competition would be good. I don't think even in the big four, anyone's particularly fighting against that. The problem is how do you, how do you get there? So I, I, I've seen um, situations on clients of mine where you've got, um, you've got the incumbent auditor who might have been the auditor for, for far longer than the current um, you know, rotation rules. So, so they will be asked not to pitch. So that you're down to three of the big four. And say this is a FTSE 100 uh, you know, complex FTSE 100 business. There'll still be a feeling that, um, that, uh, that a mid-tier firm can't necessarily do that. There are exceptions to it and there are uh, one of the mid-tier firms that have one FTSE 250 audits, in, 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 certainly anyway. Um, so you're down to three. If one of the big four then has material, uh, you know, really significant advisory relationships with, uh, with that firm, there'll be a decision for the company and for the firm whether they really want the audit. The company might say you've got to pitch for it anyway, but they might not want them to because they might actually need them to fulfill their services. So you could straight away be down to, to two firms pitching against each other, which most people would say is not, is not you know, an effective competition. But the question is, I, I, how do you get to a point where, where you have more competition? You know, I think some of the, I'd freely, freely say some of the recommendations around joint audits, so for instance, are pretty unworkable if you look at it in practice. Um, and uh, you know, then, so some of the recommendations of how you might get there are unworkable. Um, clearly, uh, some of the mid-tier firms having just as many challenges as, uh, as the big four. And so whilst, uh, and obviously, you know, in, in auditing global businesses, you haven't just got to have a strong local um, competitor, but you've got, to have bus you've got to have audit firms that can actually handle a, a global audit because otherwise they're always going to be, um, have a glass ceiling of not being able to get into the top tier of, of audit. So I'm probably not answering your, I, 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 a simple answer to your question is yes, competition would be, would be positive. And I don't even think, you know, big four audit heads would, would, would debate that. I think the debate is all around how do you actually get there without um, compromising the quality of audits at a time when what everyone needs is the highest quality audits possible to underpin um, you know, confidence in capital markets? Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that question, Ewan. I think we'll just move to the chat because there's a couple of questions that'd be nice to pick up from there. Um, so, Mohammed Saleem, you, could, would you like to ask your question that you've put in the chat there, Mohammed? Uh, hello. Hi, yeah. um, thank you, Mark, uh, for your time. Um, some really good tips out there as well. Uh, my question is, so I am an engineer and if I move towards consulting in the big four, so I'm, I can definitely not go for a chartered engineering status. Um, and if, if you're not going for audit, you'd definitely not go for an ACA qualification. So what sort of professional development do you think people in consulting would go for? And is there anything that the big four offer? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, engineering, as given how strong Sheffield is on engineering, you'll be pleased to hear that engineering is a great, a great foundation for a, a career in, in consulting. Uh, one of my... Uh, mentors along the way was a was an automotive engineer um, by background and uh, you know rather than accountant it's a really strong um, a really strong uh, grounding for career consulting. In terms of other skills, I mean I talked about what I gained from doing an MBA. And I think um, you know I was fortunate because I got to do the MBA without changing uh, employer without taking a year out of funding it myself. Um, so that was quite a fortunate experience. And I didn't use it to change career. A lot of people use an MBA to change career direction. I used it just to give me some of the, some ammunition, if you like, some tools some frameworks to, to use in the consulting work I was, I was doing and found it a good chance to uh, think, you know, and get back more in some of the more intellectual, um, uh, you know, stimulation of, of, of learning about, uh, learning about business, which I found for me was really valuable for some other people uh, would, wouldn't get as much out of it. An MBA is quite an experiential 
qualification rather than a you know rather than a kind of quantitative learning uh, that a lot of other things are. So I got a lot out of that. I think it's a important part of a um, of a career in consulting personally. But it's not for everyone. Like but you could get a lot of analytics is coming in as well. You could get a lot of an MBA through. You just mentioned like AI and BI is also coming in. So like, are they offering any sort of qualification for you to learn how to manage data? Exactly. Or... So I also think, you know, well, I think it's, it's, it's kind of software specific. So most of the people in my team now go through Alteryx training and then sort of powered BI and things. But then there's also things like, uh, you know, some of the more advanced you know, people use uh, Python and so forth. So I think if you, uh, of that, um, if you have the aptitude, and you can either do online courses or um, online courses or um, uh, uh, or um, teach yourself those those packages, then they're incredibly valuable to um, uh, incredibly valuable for a career. And they they are what's amazing is how quickly people pick some of those packages up now. I see people sort of teach basic skills in themselves basic skills in Alteryx, for example, pretty quickly over a weekend. So if you have the aptitude for those things, they'll, they'll always be valuable skills as well, and probably more um, probably more practical in some ways than what you'll learn from, a, from an MBA. But obviously the tools that we're using are changing all the time as well. So I think you'll always have to keep adapting and learning new ones, uh, a bit like languages uh, in a way uh, before that. Thank you, very much. Much there. thank you, Mark, and thank you for that question, Mohammed. Uh, could we move on to Catherine Mortlock's question, please, about opportunities outside London, I think. Do you want to ask your question, Catherine? Yes. I think... Hi, Catherine. I've seen there be more in London. Is there any to graduates who live north, um, like whether relocation would be necessary to be as successful as yourself or anything across that kind of sort? If yeah, miss I, I, um, I, I think the question was, I think it was, it was about whether London is at the centre of everything or whether you can, uh, um, how important is or not, I think if I forgot the question. Yeah. So look, um, yeah, and I hope, I hope I didn't give too London centric an answer. As I said, I've I've um, I've worked as, as much as I've worked in thirty six different countries, I've also worked all around the UK. So I actually think um, uh, being London based is, is not the be all end all at all. I think what you've got to blend uh, just like big firms versus small firms is not is not clear cut. So, I think you'll gain earlier experience in some of the some smaller clients, and possibly even in, in some of the smaller firms. Um, and uh, you know that's often um, a valuable grounding. We I've seen a lot of colleagues come from uh, either outside of London and or outside of Big Four um, and progress through very quickly because they got really early exposure to. Um, to more responsibility um, or different parts of the role and really uh, flourished as a result of that. So definitely not, unless you're going to go and do sort of something very financial sector based, you know, if you want to go and audit banks or do, um, uh, you know, con uh, do compliance sort of consulting in, in banks or something, then, you know, it's going to be quite London centric, but a lot of other things are, um, you know, much, much less London centric. And I also think is a post COVID world where we've all got used to working online i've uh, i've had i've had people in my team working in uh from for several months in mexico india uh switzerland you know and on and on and you don't even know where they are so it's it, the irony is if we can work from mexico or switzerland or then you know then sheffield or london is surely not not uh, beyond uh, uh beyond our, our wit thank you mark Thank you. That's very interesting and uh, hopefully, yeah, possibly something positive that's come out of the, the situation. So hopefully we've just got time for one last question in the chat that's from Christopher Unsworth um, about uh, challenges. Christopher, can you read your question, please? 
Hi, Mark. So thank you for your time, first of all. So I was just interested in you talked about the, the importance of continuously learning. So I know you obviously went and did your MBA, but how have you found the best way to sort of do that on a more frequent basis? So has that been sort of taking on those challenges in the workplace or learning from colleagues, or has it been sort of off your own back by sort of doing reading and courses and things like that? Yeah, that's it. It's a good question because the, the learning opportunities do tend to um, dry up a bit more as you get as more senior you get. So you have to find different ways to learn and time becomes more difficult as well. So I was fortunate the last kind of, I mentioned that program I did at London Business School, that was about three years ago. So that was, I was fortunate to, to do that, which gave me some structured, uh, sort of seven modules of structured learning and some amazing uh, experiences that London Business School put together, like going out to, to, to Cape Town and, and meeting local entrepreneurs there in some of the townships and so forth. So there's a real sort of discovery-based learning, which I think, you know, look, that may be difficult to organize exactly on your own, but I think you can learn from, um, you know, from different experiences, things you may be doing outside of work as well. They're all, they're all kind of um, uh, experiences that you will, um, could be additive to, to what you bring into, into, into work. I think um, it's unfashionable to, to say, but uh, I've probably learned quite a lot from clients as well. So I've had a number of uh, senior clients who've ended up being mentors uh, to, to me along the way, both when I was working with them on projects and quite often beyond. So I suppose more and more now I, I learn from the, you know, the privileged position that um, being a big four partner gives you in terms of the, the sheer range and um, of people you meet uh, from different walks of life, you know, some really, some really high quality people. So, so when I was being interviewed for the board role um, at KPMG, I was, I was being in, interrogated or interviewed sorry, uh, by um, an ex-head of MI5 <laughs> so, and then spent three years sat on the board with, uh, with him as well. So, you know, you meet some pretty extraordinary people who, I mean, obviously can't say very much about what he did for, uh, for, for a living for, for many years. But you do, this is one example, you meet, you meet people from, uh, you meet some extraordinary people. And I think that's, um, that's one of the ways that I probably learn a lot now is from the the people I get to interact with more than necessary and, and, and still the projects that we do and the, and the people in the team, you know, but it's from other people rather than more classroom based or, 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 or textbook based learning. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for that question. Some great advice there about, yes, drawing on, you know, others around you, which I think uh, is great. Um, I think that probably brings us up to, the close uh, mark so thank you so much for sharing uh, your career journey with the, with us and all of that insight 